Fire and Emergency Services Instructor, 8th Edition, Chapter 5, Learning Environment. So let's talk about the learning environment, Chapter 5. We're going to talk about the classroom settings and arrangements commonly used for fire and emergency services training. This is where we're going to talk about the stuff that you're going to have to do in the uh, learning information, the learning activity for today. You must be prepared to adapt to a location to create the best learning environment. You can see there that you've got an instructor, it looks like they're out in the bays working on SCBA, and he's got chairs set up so that the students can watch, they're close, they can see everything going on. Here at Brooklyn, we use the either around the table or the U version. Uh, we could set this classroom up differently if we had to, but for the most part, we teach in a round robin, or not round robin, but we teach around the table. Next slide is going to show a couple of training environments that we normally can train in, and we'll talk about those one by one. So, the hollow square conference side is, is what Jeff says we are. So, seating arrangements can have an effect on a learning environment. But you've got your fan style, you've got your traditional style, you've got your auditorium style, you've got a hollow chair or conference style, chevron style, horseshoe style, circle chair Scott style. So let's go to fan style. What, uh, what kind of pros and cons do you think we're going to have with the fan style? Okay, Jeff says might be good for small and large groups, or not large groups, but small groups. Why is that? Right, okay. Okay, <clears throat> all right. Eye contact is a big thing, and I, and I appreciate Jeff bringing it up. Losing attention to the students in back. Thank you, Kevin. You have to be able to identify what kind of material you're pushing out and make sure it's it's conducive to that environment. So if I'm teaching or if we're doing a reflection, if we're doing some debriefing and some feedback, which style do you think we're going to use in a small in an engine in a small engine company? Let's say we're in an engine company, we get back from a run. We decide to sit down and debrief. Which style do you which which do you think is more effective at getting that information out? Kevin says circle. Jeff, what do you think? Circle's a good one. Chevron's a good one. I would use a circle, <clears throat> and the reason why I would use a circle is because you're going to be trying to engage every single member of that company in talking about what they did wrong and what they did what they did right. Um, when I taught in scouting, they, uh, we, we had something called a reflection. And a reflection is nothing more than a debrief, an exercise debrief. And we often do those types of things in a circled chair style so that everyone can see everybody else and it implied that everybody in that group was an equal including the instructors. So you would actually sit there and you would sit in that circle and go around and debrief that particular lesson and, and get feedback on what that lesson was. Um, what do you guys think about the traditional style, the traditional classroom? You're mainly focused on the teacher. You're not in, in a group dynamic. That's why we use the hollow square in the, or the conference room here, because we want to get that information out from everybody. And we want to make sure that they've got room to kind of spread out a little and read the information that's been presented to them. I like the conference style just because it, it, I can see everybody at the head of the table, but everybody else can see everybody else. Does that make sense? What do you guys think, what kind of uh, class, what kind of deployment are we going to use in auditorium style? Interaction between the student and the instructor. 
When will we use an auditorium style learning environment? Large group. Okay. Uh, a lot of large training. A lot of times you've got, and we use these a lot with the audit and review as far as the auditorium style. This is the, the classroom over at Brown is set up kind of as a mix of traditional style and Chevron style. But they basically want you to be able to focus on the instructor and get the information out. How about the horseshoe style? When would you guys use that one? Okay. Allows for interaction between each other. It allows for interaction with the students. Small groups. Conference between a shift, maybe. Okay. So what I want you guys to do is I want you to go back through and look at the text and look at the slides and talk about the pros and cons of all these different learning styles. If we were in a live class, what I would have done is I would have taught, you know, a good portion of chapter four in one style. I'd have switched it up and then switched it up again just to kind of give exposure to the different groups. Since this, since this is a distance hybrid, it's kind of hard for us to do that. So the responsibility will be on you guys to look at the text and research those specifics. Moving on. Permanent classrooms have lighting designed for a learning experience. They either have fluorescent bulbs, which we have here at Brooklyn, or you have incandescent bulbs. The lighting can be important. If the lights are flickering on and off, if you got a ballast going out in the fluorescent fixture, it's going to bug at least one or two of your students. So make sure you've got the proper lighting in the room at that point in time. So we're back to what settings and arrangements are commonly used for fire and emergency services, training, fan style, traditional style, circle style, horseshoe style, conference room style, so on and so forth. Anybody got anything to add so far? All right, moving on. This was brought up, I believe, on either Tuesday or Thursday. Temperature of the classrooms can create a distraction for students and instructors. So you have a learning environment that is either too hot or too cold. So you're going to have to make sure you've got a balance for the students that are in your classroom. Some people are going to be hot. Some people are going to be cold. Try to set your thermostat in the middle range so you don't really have that affected. Become familiar with HVAC systems. You kind of have to know a little how the thermostats work and how, how the room heats up or cools down. That's something as far as knowing your training environment. Open windows or use portable fans if it's extremely hot. We try to train in air-conditioned environments. We try not really train, but we try to do the classroom and um, inside in the inside sometimes. Can't really use fans to get a good portion of the time. But just make sure that you're making those concessions for your students. And then provide more rest breaks. If if it's cold or if it's warm in here, and I see you guys tuning out, then I'm gonna adjust my teaching and my train my teaching to you. And I'm gonna instead of having a break every hour, we're gonna go with a break maybe every 45 minutes just to keep that going and moving on. This is a big one right here, especially for the fire service. Locate and eliminate potential sources of noise. So lower the volume on loudspeakers, radios, and pagers, or turn them off. This is a big one when we've got crews that are in service. When you're in a station, you've got crews that are in service. You need to make sure that you've got coverage. Um, one thing about this, and I'll cover it now, you have to identify who, when you're teaching a fire emergency services class, 
not only do you have the crew or the individuals that are in your class, but you have the individuals that are in your class that are that will be responsible to make runs while class is going on. <clears throat> so for example, if we caught a run right now here at Brooklyn, chances are I would kind of hang out for a few moments and see who is all coming on the run. Because you want to make sure you conduct class with as little disruptions as possible. And there's nothing that is more disrupting sometimes than a run in your first do. So make sure you're turning your radios down, your pagers down, or turn them off completely. <clears throat> Consult with students who are on call and how they will be contacted. Especially in a fire class, since we're teaching here, all of us Brooklyn guys are on, technically on, on call at that point in time. So you need to have a policy developed as far as individuals from the host department or individuals from the other department are responding during class. And then you need to prepare your class for potential interruptions. So for example, um, at Indianapolis EMS, Monday through Friday from 8 to 4, I'm on call for them. If I'm in a training, if I'm in a meeting, it's my responsibility to go back and talk to my chief officer and make sure he knows that I will either be operating on a delayed response or I will not be able to respond at all. But for like a battalion chief or an assistant chief or a different chief, they're going to be on call and they, they will expect or you they will be expected to take the run no matter if they're over in class or not so make sure you discuss that with your students on the first day of class and say hey look turn your radios down turn your pagers off only have one or two of them going in the classroom so that you guys you know when you have a run or not and then prepare your class for potential interruption tell them off the bat hey um, the guys that are here from District 4 were on call today, we're in service, they may have to leave in the middle of the classroom presentation. <coughs> know how to avoid distractions when using audio-visual equipment. Do not stand between the audience and the projected image. You want to locate the projector so it does not obstruct students' view. You want to make sure it fills the screen without extending over the edges, and you want to ensure that the projected image is not distorted. So if I'm moving around the classroom, and the projector is set up in the front, and it's at eye level, I want to make sure that I avoid walking in front of the training room and walking through in front of the projector. The projector is set up so that it doesn't obstruct any students' view. It's actually sitting on a plastic bin projecting towards the screen. It's filling the screen area without extending over the edges because that can be annoying to some people. I know it is to me. And you're going to ensure that it's not distorted or fuzzy or anything like that so your students can actually see it and can actually use it. You want to locate the projector so the motor noise is at a minimum. It's not providing a distraction to some of your students. As you guys know, some, some students have difficulty learning with a lot of noise in the classroom. So you want to pick a projector that has a low fan motor or a low sound when the fan motor is engaged. You want to use graphics that are clear, large, and visible from the most remote part of the view area. So the very first thing that I do when I set up a new training room or when I'm somewhere different is I'll walk to the back and I will make sure that my slides are visible. If not, you may have to show up the size of the graphics or put them in the middle of the screen. And the same goes for text. You need to make sure that's there as well. <clears throat> and then you want to elevate small props and demo items so that all students can see them clearly. especially with nozzles and ticks and other things, the students need to be able to see them clearly. Take time to test a presentation before class. So for example, 
when I was laying out this class and still continuing, I spent a whole night here projecting my class and making sure that the streams were running, making sure that the conference software was running. I actually had to go in and set up all the conference software, conference calls, stuff in the YouTube stream. I actually worked on that for a good three or four days before the course just to make sure that all my technology was in line and I was ready to go for the class. <clears throat> but that's important. Be aware of other cl <clears throat> classroom considerations. First one's a huge one. Power outlet access. Where's your closest outlet? How much stuff are you going to have to plug in and set up and make sure it's functioning correctly? <clears throat> Do you have internet, phone, and cable TV access? Very first night of class, I went to a couple of you guys. I said, look, um, we're going to be using the internet. You guys can bring your, bring your own devices. Here's the internet code and key. Go ahead and get in and make sure you're set up. And that is especially critical if you're teaching hybrid because you have to make sure that the students have access to the websites and to the resources while they're in the classroom. Um, that is especially true for classroom based stuff, not so much the practical evolution on the fire ground stuff, but especially for lectures, make sure you have that kind of access for students because they'll need to use it. Are there any visual distractions? Is there anything that's going to take away from your students and doing things up front? And then comfort facilities and emergency exits. A lot of times if you're teaching at a full-time department or if you're teaching at a combo or a full-time department, they'll have locker rooms, they'll have all kinds of stuff. They'll have their day room, they'll have their watch room, they'll have their kitchen. <clears throat> What sort of facilities exist to take care of your students' needs? Because there's nothing more distracting than having to go pee in the middle of a demonstration or in the middle of a class. So make sure, make sure that students have access to the comfort facilities and they know your feelings on it. Um, for example, you know, let's, let's kind of go in a direction here for a moment off the slide. For example, when I'm walking people in and out of the room, I think it's a big, yes, it is, it is. So something I was getting ready to say is my, in my classes or in classes that I take, sometimes I'll get up and I'll walk to the back of the classroom and I'll stand up and, and kind of watch. Because if I sit in a chair for too long, hour, two hours, I get distracted and I start getting ready to fall asleep. So what I'll do is I'll stand up and I'll walk to the back of the classroom so I can still see what's going on, but I just sometimes I have to get up. So um, whatever your, <clears throat> your feelings are on that, if you want people to wait till the break, then make sure you're giving breaks in, a, in an appropriate time frame so that you avoid those distractions. But yes, you're right, Sheldon. People walking in and out of the room is a big distraction. You want to make sure everybody's in position so you can take a look at them and see if they're receiving the material that you're sending out. So how can the classroom be best organized for effective learning? Make sure you've got the right layout. You want to make sure that you've got the, the training and the classroom set up to, to be the best benefit for your class. Light is huge. huge, yes. Noise. What's that, Jeff? Noise. noise. Minimize distraction, minimize noise. I know if we get a run right now, we're going to have people walking through the training room trying to get to different points to the station. Be prepared. Okay. Power outlet, access, internet, temperature. Good job, Kevin. 
Discuss what environmental factors need to be addressed when training at a remote site. So there's a lot of times when we go out, and especially I've noticed this with a lot of the training burns we've been on lately over at the Greens area, but you need to sit down and take a look at the environmental factors when you're out there on a remote site. So what are you going to do for food? What are you going to do for parking? What are you going to be doing for restrooms? What are you going to be doing for all that kinds of stuff? As gentlemen, sometimes we don't remember that people have to use the bathroom. So what are you going to do for those female firefighters on the fire scene for them to be able to use the restroom? Because there's nothing worse than having to hold it for the entire time during a training session. Jeff says make him find a tree as, as well. <laughs> Maybe a bush if possible. But that's a huge thing as well. you, you got to look at that type of stuff when you're training out on training sites. <clears throat> and then summarize the planning considerations necessary before training in a permanent training facility. <clears throat> we'll move forward to the slide here in a moment. So you got to know what facilities are on your training ground, <clears throat> your props, your permanent facilities, your mobile facilities, your remote sites, your acquired structures and facilities. <laughs> I see Sheldon is channeling his uh, inner um, What's the guy's name? Adam Sandler. Billy Madison. Perfect. Perfect. But these are all things you need to think about. How are you going to get your props to the training ground? Are they there already? Do you have to construct them? Do you have to tear them down to move them? What kind of stuff do you have in permanent facilities? Is it burn capable? Is it not burn capable? What kind of drills are you doing? Do you have to remove asbestos, especially from an acquired facility and an acquired structure? Let's talk about mobile facilities. The state of Indiana has a pretty good mobile simulation lab that they do live burns in. I think they had it over District 3 maybe five or six years ago. But you got to know, you know, what kind of capabilities it, it's got with it and you need to make sure you adapt your lesson plan and your training model to be able to go through the evolutions you want to go through and then you have remote sites <clears throat> you have dry hydrant sites for example we have a dry hydrant a few dry hydrant sites here in brooklyn's area so those are remote sites that we train at as well we train there at the hydrants just to make sure they're flowing and functional because there's nothing better than training on the actual stuff you're going to be using. And then you have your required structures and facilities. Um, you have to go through with the NFPA live burn guidelines, go through and make sure you strip out all the asbestos, all the tar and all the all the shingles and all the stuff that's going to be that, that's going to be bad for your guys. That's on the burn permit. But you got to also go in and you have to number all your windows and number all your rooms and set up all your burn pods and stuff like that. There's a lot more that goes into an acquired structure and a facility than showing up at nine o'clock Saturday morning and just, you know, setting stuff on fire. You can't go all willy nilly for that. Um, guys around here that are good with that, the Mooresville guys are. I mean, you guys do a lot of live burning down in Camp 14. <clears throat> a department that does this really well is Green Township. Green Township does a lot of burns. Chief Phelps and Captain Ennis and those guys over there do a heck of a job preparing the evolutions and, and getting everybody through the training stuff that they need to get through. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, Jeff just said that they smoke stuff up a lot of times, but they don't actually burn, so... Sounds like you guys do a lot of what, search and rescue, thermal imaging technology, stuff like that. Yeah. <clears throat> now, 
Well, that's huge. Um, it goes back to knowing your resources. You have to know what's available. For example, if you come here to Brooklyn and say, hey, what kind of training can we do in Brooklyn or what does Brooklyn do well? Um, you know, we do a lot of stuff. We do a lot of training on RIT. We do a lot of training on engine company tactics and things like that. We do a lot of medical training here because that's what 75% of our calls are. So we do medical training at least three or four times a year. I do skills a couple times a year. But you have to know which facilities are going to be there on the training ground. And you, ha you have to know who's got what. For example, um, Mooresville's got their training tower that they've got now. Bargersville's got a pretty good training tower. Bloomington Township's got a good training tower. This goes back to knowing and using your resources and, and knowing what's going on. And it's good when you talk to other departments and figure out what they have available to them because not only does it offer you the work chance to work, the time to work together, it offers you the time to do training together. So when you go out with them on runs, you know how they're going to react. You know how they're going to function. Kind of a little bit of an aside there for a moment. <clears throat> what kind of remote training sites and potential training uses do we have for these? So, emergency vehicle operators course, something I teach. Normally teach it in the spring and the fall. Where do we do that at? A lot of times we go out to the parking lots over at Lafayette Square Mall or what was known as the former Lafayette Square Mall in some folks' minds. And we'll go over, we'll take over at least two or three parking lots on the back end, and we'll do EVOC over there. What else, what other kind of training can you do on a parking lot? Extrication, drive operator, ladder, aerial operations. Anything and everything you can think of. Guys, you got any, any points you want to chip in here? Yeah, propane trend. We always, was that the one here? Yeah. <clears throat> Jeff brings up Martin to the high school around here. You've got a couple, a couple of parking lots up here in the north end sometimes. Um, Subdivisions under construction. Why would you want to train in a subdivision under construction? All right, that, exactly. What we talk about in the fire service, we talk about knowing your enemy, knowing about fire. The enemy is the building. So what better way to get familiar with layouts and buildings and building construction in your jurisdiction than going out and seeing a subdivision under construction. <clears throat> lightweight trust, lightweight construction, all kinds of stuff. I, uh, I actually have, or, or there's a buddy of mine I work with at IEMS who actually just built a house over in North Madison Crossing. And when he went through building his house in North Madison Crossing, I asked him, I said, is there any way that I can get your blueprints and some of the pictures for your house? So I actually have a blueprint set and pictures of this guy's house while it was under construction for us to use when we talk about lightweight building construction and tactics these days. Let's talk about acquired structures. What is an acquired structure? Kevin says, layout of a new neighborhood, driver training, hydrant locations if possible in those subdivisions. <clears throat> yep. So an acquired structure, as Jeff and I were just talking about, an acquired structure is one where you guys actually get a house donated to you by a homeowner or a landowner and then basically you prep it for burn and then we burn it to the ground usually. Um, you can also do wall breaches and ventilation and different other tactics in those acquired structures as well. <clears throat> Military or government owned reservations. What's, there are two examples that I can think of right off the top of my head 
about government owned reservations here in Indiana, here close. You've got Atterbury and you've got Muscatatuck. And I haven't been to Muscatatuck before, but I hear that they've got a lot of different stuff out there. They've got a hospital. They've got all kinds of things out there to be used. And that's owned by the state so that you can go out and train and work under real conditions. Have you guys ever heard the, uh, you guys ever heard the, the saying, work like you train, train like you work? <clears throat> that provides an example there. Uh, let's talk about airports. We have a large airport here close. We are fortunate enough on this department to have contacts at airport fire, not just the rank and file guys, but a couple of battalion chiefs there at the airport. Piscataway, good good feedback from you guys, Jovi. Awesome place for a week there. Chief Allison, tons and tons of stuff. Water tra task train or water task force train there. I assume Piscataway or Atterbury. Uh, airport has quite a few parking lots. So as we move forward, you can probably look to see that we might be doing some stuff on the airport since we have access to it. That's something we'll, we've been talking to the airport fire people about for a couple years now. Grain elevators or silos? Where's the closest place here where you can go train on an elevator in a silo? Bargersville. Bargersville has a brand new silo and grain elevator um, facility over there on their training ground. So, talk to Chief Funkhauser about using that. Industrial sites. We don't have a lot of them around here down in Brooklyn, but we do respond with Mooresville on quite a few of them, Packmore, Toa. Important to be able to, to know and pre-plan and be available for figuring out what's on those industrial sites to do some hazard investigation and make sure that you know tactics for that particular area. Big next one's a big one for extrication vehicle salvage yards. Um, we've got at least one in our jurisdiction. There are a couple in Martinsville's jurisdiction and a couple around. Basically. Um, you do extrication on them because you know the vehicles are already torn up and you don't have to worry about training on a parking lot or somewhere outside your station and having all the fluid leaks and things like that. You just go to the salvage yard, you, you talk to the guys there, you say, hey, we want to work on a couple of cars. They say, okay, no big deal. That way you don't have to worry about runoff or any other thing like that like you would at, in front of your station. Warehouse and aircraft hangars, there's a big one. Let's talk about um, strategy and tactics in a warehouse or even an aircraft hangar, somewhere big like that where you can move around, where you can train on different things. Um, a lot of guys have been getting hurt over the past 10 years in warehouses, especially cold storage warehouses. Um, you had that incident over in Worcester, Massachusetts. You had the Charleston Super Sofa store. Not really a warehouse, but a wide open big box store thing. You've got like your Walmarts and things like that. It's important to make sure that you're training in areas like that so you're familiar with the hazards in those particular areas. Know the potential considerations to address between during inspection and planning. So you need to talk about the weather conditions. If we're training in January in Indiana, are we going to be doing driver pump operator evolutions when it's three below outside? You can, as long as you have the truck and pump gear, but it's not really that advantageous. And most instructors would not recommend doing it because you've got to, you've got to basically adapt for those conditions. Let's talk about terrain. 
is the terrain manageable? Especially with its acquired structures, where are these where are these places at, and what kind of equipment are you going to be able to park and put on the training ground in a high in a rough terrain area? Vehicle traffic. This is a big one for us, especially because we train in a lot of acquired structures that are on roads. So what are you going to have to do for vehicle traffic? Are you going to be able to get apparatus off the side of the road? Or are you going to have to leave it on the roadway so you don't sink into the yard? Training ground noise. If you've ever been on a training ground or a fire ground, you've got pumps that are running, you've got generators that are running, you've got saws that are running, you've got radio communications. How much is that going to impact your neighbor next door, John Q. Public, when he says, well, you know, the fire department was out here training the other day, and they were loud, and so on and so forth. You don't really want to be out on a training ground at 9 or 10 o'clock at night. Not that you want to in the first place, but you don't want to be out there late with a lot of noise going to your neighbors. That's a quick way to upset them and to turn them from pro-fire department to negative fire department. Light levels, different type of noise, light noise. Site space is a huge one, <clears throat> especially for parking, especially for setting things up. You know, if we're here in Brooklyn and we are training on a house on South Main Street, the houses are relatively close together. There's not a lot of space to work around them. So you're going to have to park apparatus in the street. It goes back to vehicle traffic. How much space do you have to do what you need to do? For live burn operations, you're especially looking at exposures. I can remember the last one of the last ones we were out with. I can't remember if this is a brown or green, but when we started burning the house down, we had to set up exposure protection on two sides of the house just to make sure we weren't extending into any trucks or any trees or anything like that. So that's something you got to consider, not just house exposures, but exposures to apparatus and exposures to, to uh, plant life and things like that. By all means, you want to leave the area cleaner than when you found it. Unfortunately, a lot of times we go out on live burns or training burns and we tend to, you know, throw water bottles around and trash around. You got to pick that stuff up, you know, leave a good impression for the homeowner and for the folks that allowed you to burn on their property. Uh, don't be a jack wagon and dirty it up. Clean it up to where it was better than you found it with the exception of the house. Environmental laws and codes. When we're talking about live burn operations, there's a lot of discussion that goes into environmental laws and codes. Access. Touched on it quite a bit in the past. What kind of access do you have to the site? And water supply. Where's your water going to come from? If you're out on a remote site somewhere in Gregg Township or Northern Clay Township or anywhere out in the country, you're going to have to have a water supply. Not only are you going to have to worry about it on the scene, you're going to have to worry about setting up a fill site somewhere where there's a hydrant. Or you're going to have a lot of tankers just lined up out on the road to you know, pull them in, work from them for a little bit, something like that. I remember we were out on a burn, I can't remember if this is a brown burn or a green burn, probably brown, but we actually took engine three. And we set up engine three at the top of the hill, pulled in a three inch supply line, and then ran either five inch or three inch down the hill to the next to the next truck. So that's something you gotta take into consideration when you're planning, when you're inspecting training sites. So a question for you guys, what environmental factors need to be addressed when training in a remote site? Don't leave a mess, obviously. Sheldon's talking about hot and cold, how hot it is, how cold it is. That's a big one. Wildlife, wildlife environmental factors, don't burn anything down, it's going to affect the wildlife. Runoff, perfect Chief Allison, runoff. Let's say you're training on some form of 
let's say you're training on extrication and you got that runoff, you got fluids coming out of that vehicle that you cut into. That's going to cause runoff. I know for a fact if we brought in a car here, dropped it in the middle of Main Street and started working on it, the town would be very upset because they are very, very, very particular about their stormwater here in Brooklyn. So we have to make sure that we're controlling runoff, that we're sending it some way. That's why we here we do a lot of extrication in the junkyard because we don't have to worry about the runoff as much. We still have to worry about it, but we don't have to worry about contaminating any water or anything like that. So that's that's huge. And, that, and thank you, Chief Allison, for bringing that up because that's a big one. That's huge. Moving on. What are your responsibilities for permanent training facilities? You have to inspect the area. You have to identify and mitigate safety concerns. There's not going to be as much of them necessarily as there were on a remote site, but you still have the obligation to the student to go back and make sure safety concerns are identified and you minimize them as much as possible. And then you have to locate simulated incidents, student parking lots, apparatus, staging, and observation seating, especially in a permanent training facility. So you just can't show up and go over to Mooresville's facility and say, and start burning away. You actually have to walk through it and inspect it, make sure it's ready to go, and make sure your guys are going to be safe when they're doing it. And we just talked about that. But what should be considered when planning at a permanent training facility? <laughs> Apparatus parking, student parking, vehicle staging, inspect your props, make, sure make sure they're safe. Anything else, guys? Webinar, guys? Overview what's going to happen. Okay. What else? Anything else, guys? Access water supply. Access water supply. Exposures. Exposures. All good stuff. Walk through it with the students. That's a big one. We do that before all of our live burns. That's an NFPA standard. You have to walk through the burn house or you have to walk through the training area with the students so they understand what they can do and what they cannot do. For example, last burn we were out with Green Township. There was a big cistern that we found when we were at, you remember that? There was a big cistern that we were walking, we were all walking around it and finally we saw it. Somebody's like, throw a pallet and a cone down. So that's what we did. We protected it with a pallet and a cone. And all operations on that side of the house were restricted to within 50 feet of the building. Other than that, you could not go around or over the cistern. Consider the arrangement of seating, ambient temperature, locations of audiovisual equipment, and other facility considerations. Instructor 1 should become familiar with any training facilities he or she may have access to, must gather the information to safely plan, conduct, and monitor live fire training. And that's the end of chapter number 5.